The following program is part two of two parts, each 90 minutes long. There is support material available at this website, including quizzes, handouts, and lecture outlines for all presentations. Consult the UCTV programming guide for the date and time that other lectures in the series will be shown. Okay, folks, staking landscape trees. Reasons for staking, to protect the trunk. We don't see this very often, but somebody might want to put a few stakes around it just so they don't mow into it or hit it with a weed eater or string trimmer or something like that. Deer antlers. Deer antlers, there's a good one up here. Yeah, you guys come up with some really interesting ones up in the foothills. To anchor it, anchor it so that the um, wind doesn't blow it back and forth. Now, I, this is the one that when I'm in Benicia or down in that area, they're always saying, oh, yes, our trees are always like this, laying on their side. Um, and they may want to anchor it so that it will s withstand the winds that they have or whatever. And here's an example, and you can see the wind is already bending that tree. But this tree did not need any real support, but it did need to prevent it from rocking back and forth and moving itself out of the planting hole, particularly when it was young, maybe going into winter or whatever. <coughs> But the major reason that we support, I mean, the major reason we stake trees is to support them. And this is the reason why we support them. And there are many different ways to support trees. This is the two by four method. <laughs> now, I love giving talks different places because actually this was sent to me. One of the foresters up in Yuba City said, oh, I've got to send you some slides. We've got some really bad examples up here too. So it was gratifying to see that. <coughs> <coughs> now this one though is in Sacramento. It's the one where the gardener has all those extra garden hoses and you know, they, they leak, but you don't want to throw them away. So what do you do with them? And that tree's not going anywhere. It's <laughs> There it is, yeah. Ugh, bad. Well, this, sadly to say, is all too common, the single stake method, where you leave the nursery stake on, pay no attention, and then pretty soon the trunk is deformed here, and it's bending here, and it's girdling it, and, and all of the problems that you will see occur with that single stake method. Well, they do um, add some humor to the discussion, but how come... This is so bad. What are the ne negative consequences to staking? The reasons not to stake. Let's look at what happens when you do stake. And I'm talking a single nursery stake where the tree is rigidly attached. These are all of the characteristics that you have with a stake tree. Less trunk taper, caliper, I mean, at the base. You know what that means? It's not as fat down there. And that also goes hand in hand with the less trunk taper. Then, because you have less trunk caliper, meaning that it looks like a pencil, and less trunk taper, meaning that it looks like a pencil, um, <coughs> is that that's why you have greater wind resistance. Because the tree then can easily snap off, can easily just fall over, blow over, because it doesn't have a trunk that can flex. And when the wind hits it, it flexes one direction and then comes back up. So that's the problem there. I think this right here, the smaller root system, is one of the most important reasons. Are we back to that same thing I said earlier about why are our trees so slow growing or not doing well? Well, if you don't have much of a root system, you're not going to grow very well. A smaller root system, that is phenomenal to think that by staking that tree rigidly, we have a smaller root system. And I'll tell you the reason for that in just a second. And less uniform xylem. You'll see a good example of this in a moment. This is because you have a single stake that is shading the trunk. What is xylem? Remember, it's wood. Okay, you're shading that. The wood doesn't develop properly because it needs sunlight all the way around. If you constantly shade the side of a, of a tree, then the xylem on that side does not adequately develop. <clears throat> and you'll again see in just a moment the problems with that. Chance of mechanical injury, it, of course, are great. Just like that single stake tree we just saw, <coughs> you will have rubbing injuries, girdling injuries, all kinds of problems with the stake and the ties. 
And then I throw the last one in, especially for the commercial people, the greater installation expense. You know, you have to spend money for those stakes and ties and all of that kind of thing. How do I know all this? Well, I'm back to our guru again, Dr. Richard Harris. He did just a tremendous amount of research, he and his colleagues at the University of California at Davis, the, um, during particularly the 60s and 70s. I want to tell you that this research that I'm talking about here was done in 1965. And I'm still talking about it today. We're still seeing bad examples out there. People don't learn very quickly, do they? What happened was they decided to grow trees with stakes and without stakes and to see what happens to a tree. <coughs> they did different species, but this happens to be eucalyptus. They're fast growing. In this case, you've got a single nursery stake. You've taken off what we call those lateral or nurse branches. And in this case, a single nursery stake you leave the laterals on, but you keep them short. In this case, no nursery stake at all, but shortened laterals. In this case, no nursery stake, but leave the laterals to grow. Let's see what happens as the tree grows. Here is what is happening. The lower limbs, of course, are all coming off. No laterals at all. This is typically what you see in a nursery even today, and I'm talking about research that went on 35 years ago. In here, we have the shortened laterals. Look at the tree here. That is staked. And then this one is the unstaked tree with the shortened laterals. And then here, someone asked me about this earlier. Here's where you see what happens if you leave those laterals or those nurse branches at the expense of the height of the tree. So you have to shorten these when you keep them on the tree. They provide nice protection, but you don't want them overwhelming and having them become so tall, I mean so long, that they then um, inhibit the height of the tree. <coughs> if you notice here, there is very little di difference in height, except for with this one. That one definitely is much shorter. This is the reason cited so often by the nursery industry for why they stake trees. They usually say that that's what the customer wants. Customers think that trees are lollipops. And if they don't get lollipops, they don't think they're getting a good tree. And what I mean by that is that they want a very long, tall tree with a little top of fluff at the, at the top of the tree. And that's what they're giving us. You know what they do to achieve that? Well, they keep them rigidly staked. Therefore, all the energy goes into producing height. No trunk taper, no caliper, and then, as we found later, no roots. But yet, it certainly does have a top. Um, or I should say less or fewer roots. <coughs> Here, though, look at the difference. It's not much difference. Statistically, it's hardly significant at all. The height is almost as tall, and yet, look at standing on its own. How much um, fatter the trunk is, how much ab more able it would be then to resist the wind. <coughs> it would have that advantage of being able to move in the wind. And this is the key to the research. They found out why is it that this is the way it is? Why are these trees doing so poorly when they're lashed to a stake? It's because the tree does not move. And trees must have movement to produce chemical <laughs> hormones called auxins. These chemical hormones <coughs> are produced in much higher quantities when the tree is allowed to move. And these are growth hormones. These auxins then allow trunk strengthening and thickness. They also increase the root. We need exercise, right, to make us strong and energetic and vigorous and all that kind of stuff and so we don't atrophy. Well, the same thing with trees. They must exercise in order to strengthen the trunk, grow better root systems. And this is a result of that research. This is what happens when you take the nursery stake off of the tree that has been staked the whole time. The trunk is unable to stay up, support itself. And it flops over. And one of the reasons, too, is that stake has shaded the xylem. And the xylem is very weak on that side. 
plus the fact that it hasn't moved either. What a much more desirable tree this is. And we've been talking till we're blue in the face for the last 35 or so years about this, hoping that trees would come from nurseries without stakes, if possible. But unfortunately, here it's still happening, and most people, when we tell them to take the nursery stake off, don't want to grow horizontal trees. And so, what are you going to do about it? And this one even has a few nurse branches down there, too. You want to mimic Mother Nature. Again, we're going back to trying to, you know, you can't fool Mother Nature type thing. And in Dr. Harris's um, literature on staking landscape trees, he showed this two-stake method with a tree, tree, uh, plastic tie that went like this and then around and back again. The two-stake method is still the desirable method, but that particular system of tying is not recommended because it leaves a knot here that rubs. Instead, we recommend that you take the tie and you take two ties, one from here over to here and one from here over to here. Now, how do you stake a tree then to mimic Mother Nature? You want to allow the tree to have as much movement as possible without the tree just leaning. So you take the tree trunk and you stake it at the lowest point possible at which it will still remain upright. You place the ties at that position at the lowest point possible in which the tree will still remain upright. That means when you take that tree trunk and you bend it back it should have the flexibility to come back to its original position. If it leans, then you've t um, staked too low, and you may need to move the tree ties a little higher. You, however, do want to stake as low as you possibly can to allow for as much movement as possible, because that's going to strengthen the tree trunk. Here's one out in the field where we're actually demonstrating that tupelo we were showing earlier today Right here is the point at which the tree is still remain upright. That's where the tree ties then are going to be placed, right here on either side. But here's the dilemma. What do we have left over? We have another two or three feet of stake there. Preferably, you would select a stake then that's already designed to meet the need of that particular planting. If you're doing a big, huge planting somewhere and you um, can bring out two foot, four foot, six foot, or eight foot stakes, whatever, have a variety, know what planting stock you have ahead of time. Because here's the problem. <coughs> this is out in the field where we actually see what's happened. Yes, they staked low, but in this case, it was probably too low. This is a very top-heavy Zelkova that needed a little bit of thinning out. Perhaps the tree ties should have been placed just a little bit higher, because even with the thinning, I don't know if it would have um, held the tree upright or not. Because look at this is the kind of tree that we're getting, with absolutely no nurse branches, uh, totally weak and helpless, and therefore, they're very susceptible, and this is exactly what happened to this tree. It sat there and it beat itself to death on the stakes and eventually just snapped right off. So it's not good to leave these stakes sticking up there. If you want the tree to flex, great, that's what you want, but you don't want it to flex itself to death. Now this is the two stake method. Um, however, they've um, not followed it quite to the letter. Look at what they've got it laced with. And that is, you can see already that it's mashing it in there. This not only will girdle, but just the crushing action alone is not good for a tree. You crush the cambium tissue, you crush the phloem tissue, you then um, reduce the number of cells that are able to, or the, the tubes basically that, that are inside the plant that are able to transport water, you crush those cells down and you don't get the water and the food transport and everything else um, even before you've actually cut into the trunk itself. <coughs> Here's another instance where you use the ties and you've got to be careful though, even the green t tree ties, if they're on too long or it's a little bit snug, do you, can you see this indentation here? 
where it's already starting to crush the tissue and that again is not healthy for the plant. And then this is the Pam Bone method here. This is ne nylon knee highs or pantyhose. <laughs> you tie up your tomatoes and melons with, well, maybe not your tomatoes, but well, maybe, but your melons and all of that. They're great. I mean, I have one, you know, they're flexible. You can move them all around. But you know, if you're not careful, you can make them pretty tight too, and they can cut. So you need to make them nice and broad. They work great. In fact, I gave this talk years ago to a park district in Sacramento, and they came back to me later and said, oh, we restaked all our trees with pantyhose. But you know, uh, we don't have any women on staff at the time. And so we had to borrow them from all of our wives and girlfriends, and anyhow. And it was funny to see. I, I wish I'd gotten a picture. Mm. How long is too long to stake <laughs> when the tree is supporting the stakes? So that's what. Um. <laughs> now, this was really sad. I had given a, pr this was at a park, um, a big Northern California Park and Recreation meeting, and it was being held in um, Vacaville. And this entire area had the worst staking and just everything I'd ever seen. It was horrible. The trees looked horrible, but particularly the staking. And one of my presentations was a short little ditty on um, ways to improve the health of your park trees and stuff like that. And here I said, you know, don't keep your stakes on and don't stake. And this poor park fellow was just dying of embarrassment sitting in the landscape because his whole landscape that he maintained looked just as bad as all my slides. <laughs> So I went out and took a picture of it, but you know what he said to me, and this is the problem with tree selection. He said, but we have a problem. They forced us, they forced us to plant these black locusts, and they put in 24-inch box and 15-gallon trees. They had this huge big old top with this little bitty root system, and they have shallow soil, and they have wind. And guess what all the trees were doing? Blowing over. And so then you put the stakes on. Well, you're in a vicious cycle. You put the stakes on, the trees um, then are taken, you know, you take the stakes off later and the trees blow over. You don't put the stakes on, the trees blow over anyhow. And you get into this vicious cycle that the trees won't stand on their own. They become dependent on the stakes. And I'm not sure what the solution at that point is. This is a very good case in point. Now, if you notice the vintage of automobile, Dr. Harris gave me this slide, um, but <coughs> he said and told me this because I wasn't there that this park every single tree that was staked blew over in a big windstorm they had but not one of the trees that was unstaked blew over so it just goes to show you again that these trees become very dependent on this and it's very very tough so we recommend that a tree be staked no longer than one year if you can get them off sooner that would be preferable if, however, at the end of a year you find that the tree will not stand on its own, that it's leaning or whatever, you've got to look at several factors. One, was it staked correctly to start with? Meaning, did you have it on the two-stake method as low as possible? If not, restake it, placing the tree ties lower. Is the tree very top-heavy? Did you get one of those really big trees? If so, perhaps you need to thin the top of the tree somewhat to reduce some of the weight of the tree. And lastly, and these are the things that are hard to see sometimes, what's the root system like? And maybe you've got girdling roots, and that's one reason the tree never really gets securely into the soil. So then if you restake it and retie it and, and redo it and you give it another season or so and it's still not standing on its own, then um, you may have to really evaluate whether or not that tree is a tree to keep. Because again, you'll see that they become dependent and at some point you'll never get it off the, um, the trees. <clears throat> this is another indication of how long is too long to keep the tree ties on. And that in this case, there's a rubber tree tie here, there's a rubber tree tie. Now do you see why I showed you that example and I wanted you to understand how cambium and phloem and xylem and all that works? Because what's happening is obviously all the food is coming down. This has girdled the trunk. You can see the tiny trunk here that it's being starved. All the food is resting up here and, and giving that um, part of the tree trunk, you know, lots of good stuff to, to um, live on and, and increase it in girth and eventually it will kill the tree. 
This was a case where I was called out to an apartment complex and on the phone they said, we've got some sort of bore problem on our alders. It's middle of summer. We want you to come out and tell us what to spray with or whatever. Well, if it was a bore problem, there's nothing you can spray with or inject with or anything anyhow. But So I went out. Now, my car is just right next to this bumper of this car. I get out of the car. It takes me all of 30 seconds to diagnose this problem. First of all, I notice the suckers coming out, and it makes me concerned. Well, gee, it's probably not root rot or something like that because it produced a lot of suckers. That means that um, it's, it was healthy and vigorous in its root system. Something else is going on up top. But now, eventually, and there were three or four of them, and they were all dead, every one of them. And here we go. See that tree tie? <coughs> yeah, right there. A rubberized metal tree tie was buried in every single one of the trees. They eventually, remember I talked about girdling, it'll eventually kill, but look how big those trees were before that happened. And it killed all of those beautiful white alders. And by the way, there is a new method out that Dr. Harris is endorsing, though I have not yet seen it. And the gentleman did call me. He's a young man um, in his real early 20s or whatever, and he has invented a new stake that is a single stake that is metal that can be reused because a lot of these are hard to break off, uh, try to get back out of the ground. And you can actually somehow ratchet it into the ground using your foot. And then it has a, um, a bar that's, um, again, rubberized or something that holds the tree out in such a configuration that the tree is still allowed to move without hitting the stake. And I, I understand that this is supposed to be better for the long term for the tree uh, for many different reasons. Those two stakes, I have to admit, a lot of times people can't get them into the ground right and they're always going like this. I see all the time, and I forgot to put it in there, well, you saw it with the garden hoses, where people um, leave the nursery stake on but yet use the two-stake method anyhow. What, I mean, that's completely defeating the purpose. And um, Dr. Harris has endorsed this particular product, but we haven't seen too much on it. So I'm not saying that a single stake necessarily is bad, perhaps there is a new technique in which you can use a single stake properly. It's just the lashing it securely so that it's not allowed to move that is the uh, detrimental feature. Anyhow, compartmentalization. Please turn to compartmentalization of decay in trees. And then we'll go back if we can. What is compartmentalization? Okay. This whole area is new research in relative terms that has gone on for the last about 30 years or so because of this gentleman right here. This is the name you need to know, Dr. Alex Shigo, S-H-I-G-O, Dr. Alex Shigo. I have been very fortunate to have been able to go to several of his workshops. He loves dogs. He is crazy about his dogs. And so I always get to sit next to him whenever there's um, dinners and things because my husband's a veterinarian. And so he just, you know, loves to sit there and talk dogs and that. But then we get to talk trees. And so I've been fortunate to be able to ask lots of questions and um, lots of information from him. And he has just revolutionized everything that we think about trees, pruning, wounds, etc. Dr. Shigo was a U.S. forest pathologist for over 20 years, Ph.D. in plant pathology. And he retired and now does the lecture circuit, puts on workshops and that. But while he was with the U.S. Forest Service, he discovered that trees do not heal. He found out that trees aren't like people. They don't repair or restore tissues in their original position, which is the definition of heal, like we do. <coughs> no. They compartmentalize. They cover it up. They close it over. It disappears from sight, but it never heals. And in fact, Dr. Scheigel likes to say um, to you that if you use the word heal in his presence more than once, he will wash your mouth out with wound paint. <laughs> now, that gives you a little idea what he thinks about wound paint, too, which we'll get to. <clears throat> Anyhow, Dr. Scheigel then cut up dissected 10,000 trees, over 10,000 trees. Then he started looking. He, he cut them up. He hacked at them. He drilled at them. And he let them go for a while. And then he cut them up and he looked inside. He used a microscope. 
he checked to see what was going on inside a tree. What's really happening when you hit that tree with your lawnmower, when you prune it with your pruning shears, when that raccoon or squirrel chops off a hunk of that bark? What is really happening to that tree inside? And that's what he's showing us here. What's going on inside that tree there? And it's fascinating. He showed that every growth ring that a tree produces is like its own separate compartment. That if you have a 25-year-old tree, you have 25 trees. It's like a, its own separate little tree within a tree. And that's, these are his illustrations here, showing us that every growth ring represents a new tree, a new chance for that tree. So with that in mind, he looked further in to find out what is this compartmentalization, what's happening? And he found out that trees, when I say compartmentalize, I mean they box in or wall in using chemicals. And they form three distinctive walls. Well, actually, they form four walls, but three we'll discuss first. <coughs> Wall one. Remember that vascular tissue I talked about, those highways going up and down, the xylem and the phloem? Well, when a tree is wounded, chemicals are produced that plug up that highway, that plug up that stream, so that fungus, if it gets into the tree, is unable to go up or unable to go down through the cells of these vascular tissues. So that's wall one. Wall two, as it says here, the last cells to form in the growth ring. The growth ring is formed from the xylem. So it, when a tree is wounded, those cells have, again, specific chemical components that are in there that are toxic to heart rot, decay fungi. And those are the wall two. So now you're starting to form a little box within each of these growth rings. You've got your top and bottom from the vascular tissue. Now you have your outer wall, wall two, that is forming from the xylem tissue, the special cells there from the xylem, the growth ring. And then you have your wall three that is forming the side walls of your box. <clears throat> oh, because wall two is the, the inner wall, excuse me. I got ahead of myself. The, um, you're forming your top and bottom. Wall two is your inner wall so that things can't go into the middle of the tree. And then wall three is the ray cells. These are special cells. If you happen to look at a piece of cut lumber, you'll find these little cells that kind of dissect uh, through the lumber. And those are called ray cells. Well, those cells also then have a special chemical component in them that prevents this decay once a tree is wounded. So let's, we'll just see more of this and you'll get a little bit better idea of what we're talking about. Here is a real um, depiction of what's going on. These are what, this is what each growth ring, see this is a growth ring in here, this is a growth ring in here, and each one of these little vessels, these pipes where the water transports up and down and the food transports up and down, well, those vessels plug up. That's wall one. Then, wall two, that last little bit of xylem, those cells, they also have chemicals that are, that are special chemicals that are built in that prevent and inhibit the spread of decay. And that prevents it from going into the middle of the tree. Then you have these ray cells that form sticking out, and that prevents it from going around the tree. And so those are the two sides. So now you've got yourself a little box, a little square box. When the tree is wounded, you can take a drill bit or something like what Shigo did here. All of a sudden, different things happen. You'll get a little decay here from an organism that goes in because right at the point of the wound, it's hard for the plant or the tree to compartmentalize there. The tissues are all destroyed. And so you may get a little tiny bit of decay in there. This shows you these different colors. He noticed that the plant immediately responds to the invasion of microorganisms, mostly fungi, by setting up barriers, by setting up these chemical barriers. And this is wall one, here's wall two, and then wall three where it won't allow it to go around the tree. 
Now, this is very important. I mean, this is, this is great that we have walls one, two, and three. Because look what happens when you wound a tree. The tree, if it's a strong, vigorous, healthy tree, it will compartmentalize easily. So no matter what you do to it, you'll get a tiny little bit of decay perhaps, but mostly just a response to the wounding from the chemicals deposited by the walls uh, one, two, and three. And as the further you get away from the wound, you can't even see that you even had decay. However, where is the cambium? Remember it's out here, you guys? What's going to happen if that's not protected? The fungi are going to get in there, right? They're going to decompose it, break it down. Well, this is where the incredible thing that a tree can do that humans can't do, and that's why some trees can live for 200, 500, 1,000 years because they form wall four, which is called the barrier zone. Wall four is a special brand new tissue of xylem, a brand new growth ring that's formed at the time of wounding. It's a very specialized tissue formed at the time of wounding. It may form all the way around the tree. It may form only around the wound. Now, I dug up an old apricot on my property that um, was failing. It had been there for years. And, and lo and behold, and this was almost 20 years ago that I did this, and I had just learned about compartmentalization and Dr. Scheigel and all of his research and wondered, what in the, can you really see this barrier zone? Is it visible? It actually is in many species because it is a different color growth ring. Sure enough, I dug up this and we sawed off the apricot. I looked at the growth rings and it definitely had a distinctive pattern here because that tree had been wounded earlier in its life. The tree responded by throwing up a barrier zone and that barrier zone is there for life. It's all new xylem laid down and it may have a slightly darker, different color to it. Now, this tree then <coughs> was able to grow another what, six, seven, eight years after the injury with no damage at all to the new tissue growing, no damage at all to the cambium except for that one tiny little spot where the wound occurred. All the subsequent cambial tissue and all the growth rings and everything are totally free of decay. Here is why we have hollows in trees then. It's because a tree was wounded. Has that tree healed? No. Has that wound disappeared? No. It may close, in this case it hasn't. It may callous over. It may seal the wound, but it truly has not healed. And what Dr. Shigo, I think why he's so picky about the fact that you don't use the word heal, is because we tend to think of heal as restored to its original condition. Whereas in this case, all we've done is just grow new tissue over the old injury. And he wants people to be aware of the lifelong consequences that wounds can have on trees. And the fact of the matter is that it can come back to haunt you years later. As in the case of a hollow. Why do we have a hollow? Because at some point, this tree had an injury on the trunk. The trunk compartmentalized. Wall one, two, and three fell apart. Of those three walls, wall one is the weakest. It usually falls apart the most quickly. So you'll get some decay going up and down the tree. And then wall two and then wall three is the strongest of those three walls. So the weakest is wall one, the strongest is wall three. But eventually, if the tree is not in good health, if you have multiple wounding, if you have a particularly strong heart rot type fungi there, then walls one, two, and three fall. They're gone and the decay runs through the entire tree. However, wall four is so strong chemically that there is only, a, there are only, I should say, about three fungi worldwide that can get through it. Nothing else can if it's kept intact. If you keep that barrier zone intact, and you can see here, 
It's totally rotted from walls one, two, and three, but the barrier zone is here, and all the wood that came after is perfectly healthy wood. The cambium is protected. The tree can live for forever. You cannot equate the health of a tree with the safety or integrity of that tree. This tree, for instance, we had a wound way back when, and what do we have another 30 or 40 or 50 years of growth on this tree? The tree compartmentalized the tree, the, um, but obviously there were some conditions that walls one, two, and three were not able to hold. Thus they, they fell and we got the hollow, but here is where wall four is. We know exactly where it is. It's right on the boundary here. And the tree later had a few little wounds that it was able to compartmentalize. Maybe this was a very large wound. Maybe it was a fire scar, something like that. This kind of wound, same thing. You ask me, okay, will the tree survive injury like this? And the answer is, many times, yes, it can. Um, it will callous it over, it'll close, you may never notice it, but it might be one of those trees 30 or 40 years from now that is completely hollowed out in the middle because it completely decayed behind closed doors, so to speak. You can't see what's going on. You don't know that it's happening. All hollows in trees come from wounds. At some point or another, there was a wound that then occurred and the compartmentalization process started, the barrier zone formed, and then the fungi just needed to come in and do their secret business behind that callous tissue. And again, here is just an indication of a trunk wound like the one we just saw. Perhaps this would eventually callous over and yet decay taking place inside. Now, this is the drawback, unfortunately, to that wonderful barrier zone. It is so weak, so strong chemically, that it is extremely weak physically. It does not form enough lignin. Lignin is the stuff that holds wood together. Therefore, years later, have you ever heard of frost cracks? Frost cracks aren't due to frost. It's like a gun. The trigger's pulled. And all the frost did was release the trigger. But the trigger was pulled because the wound is what caused the frost crack. The wound set up a barrier zone. The barrier zone doesn't have enough lignin in it. It's weak. And then it all splits out. And then guess what? The tree has to recompartmentalize all those wounds again. So when people call or when you see cracks, and I'm not talking about a scabby old apple tree that just has cracks all over the bark because when it gets old, the bark really looks scabby um, and all cracked up. But I'm talking about a true crack that goes through the tree or into the bark area. That is due to a, a wound. Now, maybe frost pulled the trigger, though, or released the trigger, I should say. And that does happen. Sun scald, same thing. You'll get cracks, often from the sun scald. But again, um, it's the wound. Then the sun scald is just something from the expansion and contraction and all those things that happen. Bammo, there it goes. And here we see it going out. Okay, back in the old days, and maybe the not so old days, we would get decay like this or hollows in trees. People were very concerned about that. And because being who we are, we always, what's that, anthropomorphize everything? So trees are just like us, right? Hey, you have a cavity in your tooth? What do you do? You fill it, right? Hey, you've got a tree? You fill it, right? So you go in, you've got this cavity in here. You, of course, what do you do with a tooth cavity? You drill it out, right? You get rid of all that old decay. Do the same thing with the tree. Make sure you scrape out all that old crud there and then put in the cement. And what have you done? What have you just destroyed that took that poor tree millions of years to evolve to? You have just destroyed the barrier zone that that tree set up when the tree was initially wounded and now it has to recompartmentalize and the decay fungi that were in here, the rot can now get into the good wood until it recompartmentalizes it. And if you don't think this doesn't go on, you just go up to Sugar Pine Point State Park, because I just took this slide. These are their pine trees right next to the Earlman Mansion. I venture to say, I don't want to stand next to this tree too long. 
I can't imagine what it looks like inside. Because what you're doing, they used to think that if by drilling it out and filling the cavity, you were doing like you did to a tooth, but you're not. The reason there's a cavity is because you already had the decay. And the decay was there, and the decay was compartmentalized, and that's why there's a nice big hole in there. And what you do then by scraping it out and putting all this stuff is, is then you're just re-injuring the tree. It would be nice if we could find some material that did not cause injury, we didn't scrape the barrier zone, that would hold it rigid just for structural integrity's sake, but nothing's been quite found. They have um, investigated using polyurethane foam, the type that you insulate with, and there's some results with that, but nothing's come along. And I have had more arborists tell me that they have gone, well, in fact, I have one. I'll show it to you in a moment. So what do we do instead? if we have a hollow in a tree. Well, a lot of people, especially at golf courses, people love to put their balls in there and their trash and everything else. And so um, you might put a screen over it or whatever. Normally, you could just leave it open. It's no big deal. It's just fine. Now, some people get all concerned because there's water in it. And maybe it's breeding mosquitoes or other little things or creepy crawlies are in there. And we tell them to take a turkey baster and get rid of the water if that bothers you. The reason that they're, you know, the people say, oh, but it's, it has water, it's going to rot. No, the reason it's, it has water is because it already rotted. And you've got a barrier zone that's acting like a vessel holding the water. It's not going to cause it to decay anymore. <clears throat> this is the one that I, one of our most prominent arborists, Austin Carroll, took me out on this call. This was at a cemetery, and this tree was rather sad looking, and I thought they probably should have just gotten rid of it, but it was an old valley oak, and they wanted to do something. And years ago, somebody had filled the cavity, and of course, you know, you have to cauterize the wound, so that's why it's black in there. They took a blowtorch to it <laughs> and made it nice and black, and uh, I guess trying to kill the fungus. Um, it's a wonder they didn't catch the tree on fire, but then he had to come in with a jackhammer and jackhammer out all the old cement. And then they cabled the tree up on top because what happens with a wound this large? The tree tends to kind of torque on itself back and forth. And so then you rot it to help prevent that torquing. And you do have a wound here, 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 and here, but it's a very small wound that can compartmentalize and close over fairly quickly. And so this is the more preferred technique than going in there and scraping everything out and filling it with um, cement. This is one to illustrate that you cannot look at a tree and say that it's perfectly healthy and equate health and safety, health and integrity. We have a lot of elm trees in Sacramento. People are, well, you're either of two camps. You either cannot stand them because of the squishy elm leaf beetles that collect in by the mounds and bucketfuls under the trees in the spring, and you want every one of them cut down or you're of the other camp and that these are precious resources that have been there for almost a hundred years and how could you dare cut it down when it looks so healthy and yet it has a hollow in it because they topped them back in the 40s and they're all decayed and rotted and limbs are falling left and right on people's cars and um, causing a lot of injury and yet they say but it looks healthy look at it I mean this happens to be a ginkgo that I took in Germany but it shows you the same thing look at that beautiful ginkgo I thought that was the most magnificent tree so I had to walk up closer to it and this was the trunk wow. is that amazing and in this case they painted it I guess just to make it look like the bark but um, can you imagine and that's what I said a tree can really live with a big huge cavity um, and still look healthy and beautiful but yet have very little structural support yet in some cases depending on where the wound is a cylinder can be as strong as a solid core so you know, it's it's hard to it's hard to know so Dr. Shigo came to Sacramento this is a earlier shot of him several years ago and he asked us to give us some trees in this case, ash trees that had been injected with chemical injections to control insects and that um, years ago, they, they aren't anymore. When you put holes in trees, whether it's to inject or anything, you are causing a wound and then compartmentalization does take place. And he wanted to ask us, is this ash tree a good or poor compartmentalizer? And I'll ask you. 
good, you're right, it's a good compartmentalizer. Because if this tree was an elm tree, for instance, and we injected it repeatedly year after year with these chemicals, pretty soon all of this area would coalesce together because the walls would be falling left and right. But in this case, this tree is able to wall off to a very small area the little compartments of decay. So Dr. Scheigel thinks one of the ways that we should go is to have trees genetically that are more um, liable to compartmentalize and be more uh, healthy in those regards um, because some trees, like elm trees and others, if you were to do this amount of wounding, would just be a rotted hulk inside. Now Dr. Scheigel, in his research, also showed that trees compartmentalize not only in their trunk area, their limb areas, but also the branches, the, the limb area. I should say not only just in the trunk areas, but in the branches, in the limb areas as well. This is a wonderfully compartmentalized branch. These were all trimmed when the tree was young. Notice here, it has closed over, but has the wound, quote, healed in the technical sense? No, there's still just a little indication here that there had been a wound there at one point. Maybe just a tiny little bit of decay there. But it has calloused over totally, and if the wound is small enough, it will, and it will totally disappear. So Dr. Shigo found, again, that there is a very, very special zone of protection at the base of every single branch called the branch bark collar. This branch bark collar right here looks like wrinkled tissue, and in fact, I have though you won't be able to see it clearly now, you could look afterwards. I have a nice log here that I rescued from the fire, and it shows wrinkles everywhere. At the base of every one of these branches, even this little guy here, there are wrinkles. Wrinkles and ridges, or ruffles and ridges. And this he calls the branch bark collar. This branch bark collar has natural chemicals that allow the tree to compartmentalize and it acts as a natural band-aid to the tree. What happens when you ignore Mother Nature and what Shigo also refers to as a natural target, a natural target pruning? Instead you make a flush cut. Remember the old adage, flush cut and paint. That was what you would do. You'd flush cut that wound and you'd slap on some um, tar and, and you think you'd done your business right. Well, unfortunately, that's the most unkindest cut of all because this is doing several things. When you flush cut, you remove all of those beautiful wrinkles. You remove the natural barrier to decay. You also create a trunk wound rather than a branch wound. And you create a wound that can sometimes be two or three times greater than you need to make. And this kind of damage to the tree can cause all kinds of problems later on. In fact, splits. Remember what I told you about splits in the tree trunk? Well, you can get them just from the, uh, making improper wounds. It's a wound, again. The tree has to compartmentalize. You flush cut the trunk, so now for the, that wound then can cause splits. And we get people asking about that all the time as well. So, there are many, many things. In fact, Shigo has a wonderful series of posters, books and things. He's got one on 100 ways to kill your trees. Um, lots, of, lots of fun things, you know, um, that you could do. But he also says there's something like 20 five different things, negative things, that happen to trees when you flush cut? Fungus. Now, Dr. Robbie would love this. Isn't that beautiful? I mean, wouldn't you love to have that in your backyard? It's so gorgeous. And I, I have to admit, I saw this fungus, and I wasn't thinking more about the compartmentalization thing as I was just, isn't that a gorgeous fungus? Well, the problem with it is, though, 
It's gorgeous, all right, to look at, but it indicates extensive decay inside the tree. Depending on which kind of fungus this is, this is a sporophore, it's called, or the fruiting body, or a conch. Some people call those hard ones conchs. The sporophore is the fruiting body of a fungus, and it's of a decay fungus. It's of a heart rot fungus. It's of one of those that come into the wood and eat up the wood inside. And it only shows its pretty little face after all of the insidious rot has gone on inside already. And so then you see this beautiful fungus. It, it, once they start popping out, they happen once a year. And every year you'll get this beautiful fruiting body, usually in the cool winter months. And then it disappears again. Oh, the fungus is gone. No, fungus is still in there. It's just its fruiting body died. And this flush cut right here, notice the decay you already are seeing here and the decay that you're seeing here, and you wonder what is going on in there? How decayed is it? This is the kind of limb that then would snap off in a storm. This is um, the kind of limb that could be very dangerous. And you do a flush cut. Do you know that bark beetles love flush cuts? Borers love flush cuts. They move in there. You can find all kinds of little holes around flush cuts oftentimes. Uh, where the uh, decay organisms have come in and then the beetles have moved in. On the other hand, you don't want to leave a stub either. Do you know that this is like a sugar stick? This is like a lollipop sitting out there for the fungus. It's full of, remember what, sugars, starches, all those carbohydrates that these fungus love, well boy, they can get into there and really start chewing and they can just ram their way right into the trunk past that barrier zone. So stubs also can be very detrimental to trees. And in fact, here's a beautiful example of a stub. And notice the bore holes, you can see little holes there as well that move in. So again, I'm very concerned with this tree when I see this fruiting structure, how extensive is the decay? These are things then that people need to go and be aware of and go find out, get a uh, certified arborist, somebody needs to probe, needs to check it out. I'm really concerned when I see this at the base of a tree because then I'm really wondering what's going on with the root system, has it rotted, is the internal uh, portion where the tree is being supported all decayed and is that tree going to go over? So when you see fruiting bodies, and this is what's actually going on. You have the stub, it gets all decayed, and it just goes right in and starts working away. And yes, the tree is trying to compartmentalize, which as you can see, uh, the further away from the wound, the more um, it's able to compartmentalize. Uh, but uh, oftentimes, eventually, though it may take years, it does break down. Okay, so. What are we going to do instead? We're going to leave those wrinkles. And we are going to do the Shigo way of natural target pruning. The tree tells you where to prune. Right there, this is a Chinese tallow tree. I'm going to take it with my nifty little saw, and there we go. Nice clean cut. You still see the wrinkles. There's a little bit of a bump left behind. People will say to me, well, how much am I supposed to leave? Is it supposed to stick out an inch or how? Well, yeah. It really is variable. You look for the tree to tell you where to place the pruning saw, and then you cut there. If a tree has a very small limb, it's a young tree, it may be almost flush to the trunk. Larger trees, trees will do this naturally. They will form their own branch bark collar and their own ridge. In fact, this was a poor fellow. He had a whole box of these, by the way. Came into the master gardener office with this thing. He had cut them off of every, or he had cut every one of them off his oak tree because he wondered and wondered what they were. Well, now that you know a little bit about compartmentalization and branch bark collars, as a, a dead limb hangs on a tree, the tree is a shedding plant. It wants to get rid of that thing. You know that dead thing hanging out there is just good fodder for the fungus, right? So the tree knows I have to get that dead thing off of here because otherwise I'm taking up a whole lot of energy trying to keep that fungus out of here by compartmentalizing all the time. So it eventually makes that branch collar swell up and choke off the offending limb and it all falls off. And he just cut off all of that poor tree's defense system by doing that. And then he made another trunk wound. And then the tree has to recompartmentalize again. Very sad, very sad. Here's a Chinese pistache. Isn't that a beautiful cut? You know, I just love those, what they used to call Japanese folding saws. Little 
oh, they, they just cut so well. They cut both ways, so they make it nice and slick. Looks like you used sandpaper on it, which I didn't. I just cut it with the saw. You can even do it with a chainsaw. City of Sacramento, tree trimming crew came through this hackberry. Beautiful cut. Looks great. Notice it's sticking out a little, though. That's okay. It's a smaller wound. That's what you want. Now, there are times when you go, well, where do I cut? I don't see any wrinkles. I see nothing. Well, actually, there's sort of kind of an area down here, but you don't want to make a wound from here to here. We actually look for the branch bark ridge here. We cut just outside of the branch bark ridge, trying not to cut into it, because that's what shows us where the collar starts. And then we make a sloping cut so that you make the smallest wound you possibly can. You don't want to come down here and go like this, because you might cut in too close to the trunk, and you're making a much larger wound than you need to. This wasn't our university, but this used to be another university's slide set. But I will show one that shows we're just as guilty. Years ago, before people ever knew about wound paints, we used to recommend the same thing. Slap on the old wound paint. Look at that flush cut. Isn't that great? And then put on that wound dressing. Have you ever read a bottle of tree seal? You know what's in it? You can roof your house with it. It tells you that you can replace shingles with it. It specifically tells you to slap the shingles back on. It's tar. That's what it is. There are a few other wound paints on the market. Some are made out of latex and that. People have tried to perfect them over the years. But there has been no demonstrated research of any beneficial effect of any sort of any marketable wound paint on the market. Nothing. Absolutely nothing has worked. There was a product in Europe that's not even in the United States that sped callousing a little called Lac Balsam. But even Dr. Scheigel says, don't let that fool you. People think, oh, you're speeding callousing. Therefore, it must be doing something. It must be working or whatever. There's still rot and decay and everything can go on. Here's the problem with wound paints. What do you need to have an ideal wound paint? Well, you need something that would immediately adhere that would never come off until the wound was completely calloused over, impermeable to all the different fungi out there. That means it has to act like a fungicide, right? You ever use fungicides? You ever spray your tree for peach leaf curl? Do you use the same fungicide for peach leaf curl that you use to spray your roses for powdery mildew? No. no. Do you think tar is fungicidal? No. That'd be like athlete's foot. You know you've got athlete's foot. That's a fungus. Smear a little of this on and see how well it works. <laughs> so. There is really no benefit to wound paint. In fact, some of these black asphalt emulsions hold the heat into the cambium and destroy cambial tissue because it gets so hot there. And you know earwigs just love to get under there when they crack. Um, and they're sort of pesky. But um, nothing then is going to keep out the decay fungi. Nothing's been found. Nothing works at all. Wound paints are literally worthless. You can add that to your other things you've learned about today that you don't have to buy anymore. So um, what you do instead, you've got a wound. Well, the trees, oh, by the way, this shows you, this had wound paint on it, and it's doing nothing. It's still cracked and everything else in there. It's up to the tree. It's up to the tree, with maybe a little help from you. When you make your cut, look for donuts. What do you mean by that? If you've made the proper cut, and you've not made a trunk wound, and you've cut outside the branch bark collar, you will get donuts. You will form nice, round, callus rings. If it's pointy on the top or pointy on the bottom, you cut too close, and you'll get to learn that. Keep the tree in vigorous um, health and condition. If the tree has extensive wounding, you're going to want to make sure that you protect it in some way, perhaps uh, making sure that you uh, pay attention to whether it needs a little bit of extra water or a little attention because it's not getting quite enough. Or You know, you pay attention to the health of the tree itself and try to invigorate it and keep it healthy. If it's got grass growing up to it, anything that's a negative impact or influence to that tree and it has a wound like this, then get rid of those negative impacts or influences. But don't think that just putting a wound paint on it is going to solve your problems because it's not. So natural target pruning, looking for nice, round, uh, callous rolls, shows that you are doing something right. And then that's the natural uh, barrier to decay that the tree has right there. And you will be successful. Now, some people will say, well, what about uh, whitewash or whitewashing trunks or whatever? And I brought my handy whitewash here. 
and this actually is, hey, I had my paintbrush too, but I guess I can. Anyhow, you can use whitewash. You can use interior latex paint diluted 50-50 with water. Do we use it on landscape trees? Not very often. We, you know where we use it mostly? Fruit trees. And the reason is, you go in there and you cut that fruit tree down at 18, 22, 24 inches because you want low scaffolds, you want good structure that you can then pick out the limbs. And are there any leaves shading that poor thing? No, and the flat-headed boars love it. Landscape trees, however, generally have a nice, shady canopy that's supposed to shade the trunk. However, you did see some of those skinny little trees that have absolutely nothing. And I have seen a real problem with certain things like alders and um, Grecian laurel that have thin bark, birch trees that have been sunburned severely because they had no nurse branches, skinny little trunks, and maybe a whitewash would have helped. Wounding, that's an area where a whitewash might help if you've got a big wound that's getting a lot of sunburn on it, if you've lost a big large limb, then perhaps whitewash would help. You're not, it's not being used as a wound paint. Just keep that in mind. It's being used as a sunburn protector. Protecting against sunburn, thus protecting against flat-headed boars and other beetles and um, boars that come into the tree. So that would be the only time, really, that I would um, suggest that you would use that. <clears throat> Proper tree pruning. Well, you can probably tell from this slide that it may not live up to its name. What is pruning? <laughs> well, I, I just love this garden. I can't believe how much time and expense, though, must go into maintaining this. This was in England. and. Uh, it's interesting the things that you find that you can use for talks later on. You take it for a whole different reason. But, I mean, trees can be pruned. Plants can be pruned. And they can tolerate tremendous amounts of pruning. Pruning is just the removal of plant parts. That's all it is. Removal of plant parts. There's many different ways to do that, though. And here, of course, if you go to Disneyland, you know the, the topiary, and you keep everything trimmed and nice, and it looks great. And you're doing a lot of pruning there. This is an espaliate apple. This happens to be my own apple tree. And yes, you can extensively prune a tree. You think of an apple tree as being 12, 20, 30 feet tall if you let it grow there, and yet you can have it flat up against a wall and still produce a wonderful crop of apples and do just fine. It requires regular extensive pruning, however. So there is nothing inherently wrong with pruning. It's just knowing how to do it the right way. And that's what we're going to learn. Pruning does stimulate growth. You know when you prune something? Do you notice that, especially a hedge, let's use a hedge, a hedge is a great example. You prune it and pretty soon there's um, twice as much hedge because it grows like crazy because you pruned off a lot of foliage in that and there's all this nice food in the roots and it goes up there and oh, hey, half, half of the foliage is gone, so all the, new st all the stuff that's there gets to grow like crazy. So it really stimulates it. But over time, it reduces the growth because pruning removes the food-making capacity of that plant. So pruning can do two things. It can really stimulate it, but over time, pruning will reduce growth. Why do we prune? We prune to improve appearance to prevent interference, and you know there are various ordinances and codes about how high a limb has to be up over a sidewalk or a street or your own driveway. Safety, you want to prevent breakage, this is a very important thing. But one of the most important things is you train young trees to proper form. And do you know how many people don't know how to do this and how many disasters we inherit later? This poor little purple leaf plum here, staked wrong first of all. And then look at all this mass of limbs. And do you think you're going to really be able to drive under that tree eventually where the part, you know, you, there's a real inherent problem here. And yet, they didn't do anything about it. Eventually, they just chopped it out because it was so overgrown and the limbs were too low. You need to start young so that someday the tree could look, well, it's not the same kind of tree. This is a Chinese tallow tree. But notice the limb structure there. Um, safe, 
You're not going to have to worry about breakage here. You've got good, strong limbs. You've got good, strong spacing between the limbs. <clears throat> And then there are other ways to prune trees. To some people, pruning just means the removal of plant parts, all right. Um, they don't care what parts they take off. And this was a, a beautiful scarlet oak that one of our local arborists had planted. And when he saw this had happened, and this tree had been in the ground for about 20 years, he was furious. And it made it into the newspapers, even. Just went in and sawed the tops and sides off of the entire tree. You know, birch trees, aren't they beautiful? Um, why is it, though, you can't quite see it, but everybody thinks they have to be planted in groups of three. Um, uh, and somebody, some lady called the master gardener and asked, do you have to plant birches in threes? I mean, they thought there was some reason that if you didn't, there, the tree would not live. Look at the beautiful pendulous branches of that tree. Where are the beautiful pendulous branches of this birch tree? Remember, it's betula pendula. It's supposed to be pendulous. They're not supposed to stick up to the sky. But when you go in and you whack off the top, that's what happens. Now, if you've heard my talk before, don't shout it out. Anybody recognize this tree? Do you recognize it now? <coughs> I want you guys to have a good look. Take one. That is how they're supposed to look, folks. That is a true mulberry that has not been butchered. This is what we all see, unfortunately. So we prune it back like this, and then a year later, oh goodness, all those limbs grew again. Now what are we going to do? And then we prune it back again. And I had some poor elderly woman call me just in misery, and she said, oh, I just, I'm on a fixed income, and I, do I have to do this every year? Uh, well, unfortunately, You've kind of started a vicious cycle, and, and it's hard to get out of. You know, one way you could try stopping the cycle is like one of the neighbors. You prune it in August. You won't have to rake leaves then. And then this is when you, you know the error of your ways. This is like the elderly woman. Now what do I do? Well, you can go in, and you can thin it out and try to retrain it, but you've got a long stick perched on a basketball there. It's really rather difficult for it to adhere. And eventually these things, yes, they grow, but then it becomes extremely heavy up here, perched, like I said, on two or three or four years worth of growth instead of the original wood that was laid down. And this fellow did just finally come in and chop the whole tree out, replanted, and now he has that little tree right there. He replanted that tree's magnificent. It's huge, and it didn't take that long. And so this is another neighbor doing what you, any good self-respecting person would do to a butchered mulberry, is just chop it out. Because what do you do? It's very difficult to restructure and reform them. And the other thing that is so sad about mulberries, I call it the mulberry mentality. People think if I can do it to a mulberry, I can do it to anything, right? You know, mulberries are pretty resistant. They come back over and over again. And in fact, it's a characteristic of theirs that was used to very good advantage. Now remember, I moved from Washington State. We moved, and I don't see anything like that up there. I've not seen butchered mulberries until we moved here. And then I knew all about the silkworm industry. And I don't know if you realize or not, but silkworms eat mulberry leaves. And you have to have all that lush, beautiful growth. And so they keep them as almost like a hedge where they have to feed silkworms. Well, I thought we must have had the largest silkworm industry in the world here in Sac you know, California. But obviously, no such thing. And people will say, if you dare to ask them, why are you pruning your tree that way? Uh, I don't know. Aren't you supposed to? This is a mulberry. Now, I'm not saying that the sidewalks here and the asphalt might look like um, mole hills because you know mulberry roots are horrible and they go everywhere and the tree eventually starts growing up like it's going to leave the lawn um, but at least they didn't butcher the top of the tree it's like any other tree it needs to be pruned properly hey you know that pruning I just showed you it's a cinch right anybody can do it get yourself a pickup truck and a chainsaw call yourself a tree trimmer <laughs> 
public enemy number one, right there. In the good old days, when you didn't have electric chainsaws, how many people were stupid enough to go out there with a two-man saw and chop off the tops of trees all day long? It didn't happen. But when the chainsaw came in, hey, weekend woodsman out there, you can... And every time I hear a chainsaw crank up, oh, in the neighborhood, ooh, I, I wonder who's out butchering their trees now? Well, what now? The two things that you have to learn is the difference between heading and thinning. And then you'll know what to do right. First of all, I am talking about landscape trees here today, folks. Fruit trees. You do head fruit trees. You'll learn about that for a distinctly different purpose when they're young. Usually when they're older, you use the thinning cuts. Landscape trees, though, there is no reason to use a heading cut. What is a heading cut? A heading cut is where you make a stub cut, where you are making a cut that is to a stub, like this first example, or you're cutting back to a small limb or a small bud that cannot resume the lead. You are cutting back to a small little lateral branch, a little twig or a little bud that cannot resume the lead, or you're cutting back to a stub. I prefer to say that it's indiscriminate pruning with really no regard to placement. This is heading. Have they cut back to a stub? Oh yes, quite well, thank you. Have they left any laterals that can resume the lead? Well, unless you count that little thing right there, I don't think so, no. And all I can think of is that the best end ran out of coat racks inside because that's about all this tree is good for. What happens when you make a heading cut? We have buds that lay dormant under the bark of trees and shrubs for that matter. And when you remove the terminal or the outermost piece of that limb or branch, the terminal bud inhibits those other little buds under there from growing. They're called latent, L-A-T-E-N-T, -E latent buds. They lay dormant. However, when disaster strikes a tree, they are always ready there to resume the lead and to form a new branch. And topping or heading is a disaster to a tree. So you'll get lots of bud formation. So let's just take a tree then, and we're going to head it. And when you head a tree, again, you're cutting back to stubs. Most people that go in and head trees, like that one you saw in the motel parking lot, don't really care about leaving anything behind. They just sort of chop off everything. Because, you know, pruning is the removal of plant parts. And the more you remove, you must be a better pruner, right? So you just cut all those limbs off. You make about 23 cuts there. You've cut back to stubs. Now, what's going to happen is all the wood that forms later, all the wood that comes later, does not have the original attachment. It doesn't have the original bark attachment. So if you've got a limb that's 10 years old and you stub it back, all of a sudden, all that growth that's coming off there doesn't have the advantage of having 10 years worth of strength. It's now got one year or two year. And then what you've got is you have all that weak wood then at the top of the tree. Because one of the cardinal rules of pruning is that you prune such that you distribute the branches within the top two-thirds of the tree, not the top third, which is what often happens with topping. As the branches grow, these limbs become very tight, compacted, and smashed together. And this makes for, again, a very unsafe condition. Well, let's look at some masterpieces of heading, which we call topping, when you go in and literally take off the top and the sides. And that's a eucalyptus. That was a eucalyptus, I guess. Uh, nothing much left of it, right? 
lawn sculpture. That's all it can be. It's certainly not a tree anymore. Even my seven-year-old daughter, as we're going around the neighborhood just the other day, said to me, Mommy, look at those trees. They don't have any ends left on them. Don't they know what a tree is supposed to look like? I brainwashed her well. <laughs> and now this is kind of a funny one. This is Bones Eye, but it's a little late. You know what happened here. It was leaning, and it was over in the neighbor's yard, and they said, get rid of that tree, and I'm not getting rid of that tree, and so I'll just cut off that and keep a little bit of it. But Now, it was a dark, dreary day, but I couldn't pass it up. It's in Orangevale. You know PG&E? You know all those telephone poles? That's where they grow them, right there. <laughs> they're cottonwood trees. I realize they're cottonwoods. Now, this is very apropos to the slide we just saw. <laughs> because that's exactly what those trees look like. And you may not like a cottonwood, but is that anything to do to it? Ugh. There are tree lawyers out there. Did you know that? They specialize in tree litigation. And I went to one of those tree lawyers' presentations and listened to a very interesting talk. And it should scare the living daylights out of anybody who tops a tree because they are going to be sued, according to this lawyer, and they are going to lose because topping a tree is one of the most dangerous things you can ever do to a tree for those reasons that I just showed you. You've got that weak wood at the top of the tree that can then just fall out. And in fact, in LA County, there was a park with a duck pond. There was a little girl playing in the water with the ducks, feeding the ducks. A eucalyptus tree that had been topped several years before and had all that weak wood way out there, the limb came crashing down one day and it made her a quadriplegic. And they won a settlement of about $1.3 million, but that's not much, is it? No. And so people get very, very concerned that trees are too tall. Am I too tall? Should I be five foot six? No, I was only meant to be five foot two. I should chop off my legs. That's exactly the same thing. Genetically, they're programmed to be a certain height. If you want a liquid amber tree, then you'd better count on the fact that you're going to get a 60-foot tree because that's how tall they get. They look cute and little when they're young, don't they? Little skinny little things, they get really big. They get really tall. No, what you do? You go in there and you top them, right? A whole row of liquid ambers because they're too tall. Well, luckily they realized after a few years of the limbs regrowing and being rather heavy and some of them splitting out and you know what they had to do? They had to take every one of the trees out. Once you top a tree, you are in a no-win situation. You do not have a tree any longer. You either need to keep the limbs off or you need to cut the tree down. A sycamore tree. First of all, you know a tree just because the silhouette, those beautiful lateral extensions and all of that, beautiful, right? Where is that when you do this to the sycamore? And these telephone lines aren't anywhere close to it. You've got to start young, of course, in a parking lot. This is a parking lot in Sacramento where we are required to have 15, 50% shade tree coverage in 15 years. You think we're going to get it when we do that to them? No. And then they grow, and there's this massive growth in here. If you look more closely, what are you going to do with all that? It's How do you prune it? It's very difficult. Oh, I stayed at a beautiful bed and breakfast, a wonderful very romantic place in Calistoga with my husband, of course. And it was called the Elms. And they had magnificent elms in the back. But in the front, they were just waiting to kill me. Because there they were. They had topped all the elms in the front of the place, and all these branches then are perched on top of that, just waiting for disaster to occur and to start splitting out and falling on somebody or rotting out. A windstorm comes along. You've got all this mass where all of this was. The wind isn't going to go run through it nicely. It's going to hit it, and it's going to act with resistance. And it can fall over, fall out. Decay. Remember those buds I told you that grow? They don't always come right out at the top. They come down a little lower. All this, then, 
is a place for rot and decay. Where is the beautiful structure of that tree? Some people go in and they chop off their ash trees to amputate mistletoe. It's like taking off your hand to get rid of a hangnail. Leave the mistletoe, I'd rather see. And here's the decay from a top tree and the extensive decay that can occur. That was an olive tree. It looks like some deciduous thing with a hunk of mistletoe in it. This was one which was an olive tree and this woman called me out and I went out and looked at it because she sued the tree trimmers. She had a collection of prized camellias underneath that she entered every year in the camellia festival. Every one of them died and then this is sunburn and the olive tree died as well. Now, I did say you can go in if you want and you can head trees and you can take big trees like these beautiful sequoias you're not going to do it to these, right? No. These have already grown. You're not going to top them because then you're going to get all the disaster that will occur. But if you start young over in Davis and you want to keep that sequoia as a hedge, you can. Just like I kept that espalier, just like they kept that ginkgo. The last thought today to take with you, and we'll probably go over by about three minutes here so we can finish up thinning, is that this is what you want to do. What is thinning? Thinning, the complete removal of plant parts back to their point of origin or back to a lateral that can resume the lead. Just the opposite of heading. You're completely removing the branch back to its point of origin or you're removing the limb back to another lateral right here that can resume the lead. Right here, you're removing the entire branch the entire branch or you're leaving a lateral that can resume the lead. You are not stubbing. This takes intelligence, unlike heading and topping. You have to understand a tree. You have to know a little bit about cutting and where to make the placement, the cut. When you do do that, you keep the natural beauty of the tree. You have limbs in their original position and you have all of the ends still intact thus those buds can then keep any other buds under control and you don't get all that wild haircut type effect growth as the limbs grow because they are in their original position and you've thinned properly so you removed competition these limbs have plenty of space in which to develop and they're not crowded here is a tree in need of pruning. Here's what I said. This is an old slide again that Dr. Harris gave me. That's tree seal, folks. Years ago, we recommended it. This was before Dr. Scheigel and before we knew that it didn't do a thing. Okay, so now we're going to thin this tree. Take a look at it. There's a lot of wood up there <coughs> that's kind of overlapping one another, <coughs> sticking out. But maybe you could, you could, it's already got pretty good structure, but look how much is on the ground. But look, we still have the natural beauty. We still have wood in the original position. We've opened it up. We've lightened it. We've allowed the limbs that are there now to be able to grow better. And it still looks good. And yet, we've put just about as much wood on the ground as those old tree toppers do. And in fact, some of the really good arborists have told me that people would come home and they'd have all the brush cleaned up and they'd say, well, what'd you do? <laughs> you know, I don't see anything. Well, which is one of the best compliments you can give a good arborist. But he said to me, he says, I started leaving all the brush on the ground because they thought I didn't do anything. <laughs> Some trees naturally don't require very much pruning at all. And to go in there and take the top of a liriodendron tulip tree would be a sin. And yet all we have to really do here is just bring up the limbs a little bit, raise the skirt up as they say so that we can walk under it, play under it. Well, you're not going to drive under it here, but maybe somewhere else you would. This one is behind our um, office, a Chinese pistache, a young tree, but being pruned while it's young sure looks a lot better than those stubbed off things, doesn't it? Well, <laughs> maybe this is where it all started. I did want to point out to you, though, that this is an art as well as a science called pollarding. The stuff that we do to mulberries is not pollarding. By the way, 
the museum, I understand, is closing um, and won't uh, be opening up. But this is pole arting. This is a, let me show you what po true pole arting really is. It is not topping. It is thinning. Can you believe it? It is a thinning cut. On the UC Berkeley campus, they polard their plane trees. And a lot of um, polarding that's done seems to be done to plane trees. They take well to it. Look at this. You cut back one year's worth of growth every year with a pair of hand shears. This is, folks, this is where our taxpayers' dollars are going. These, this is a crew, the gardening crew at UC Berkeley, and he told me it took them about three months to get through doing all the pole arting in between their other chores. But look what they're doing. One pair of hand shears removing an individual limb that is a thinning cut. And they've had to train it since the very beginning. Whether you like that or not, whether it appeals to you, this is true pole arting. And what we're doing to trees in topping, please don't call it pole arting because it's not. There is another type of cut that people think, aha, I'm not topping trees. It's a thinning cut. I'm thinning. It's just as bad because look what you're doing. This is called lion's tailing. This is extensive thinning where an inexperienced arborist or somebody that doesn't know better or someone that's doing it on the cheap starts at the bottom, works their way up, and just strips all the limbs off all the way up. You'll get extensive sprouting off the trunk, but more importantly, before that occurs, a thin bark tree like these ash trees, extensive sunburn. Plus, where's all that growth? Top third of the tree, right? Prone to wind throw, blowing over. So, and this is the ultimate. When you're a homeowner, you come home from work, you have a tree trimmer that's pr pruning your magnificent 200-year-old blue oak tree, and this is what you come home to. This is all that's left of it. There's a tuft of growth up in the top, and they stripped off, flush cut, mind you, every single limb all the way up, and they did it with climbing gaffs or spurs, spikes, all the way up. And many very good arborists, some of uh, the best arborists in our area say, you never climb a live tree with spurning, pruning spurs, ever. The only time you need pruning gaffs or pruning spurs or spikes is on a dead tree. In most, most instances. Every so often we get a big old eucalyptus that that doesn't work on. Well, if you love your trees, you know, sometimes we love our trees, but look what we do to them. You know? Um, you got to learn to listen to the trees. They might have something to tell you, right? There's a face in every tree. Story to tell. The old cottonwood at Sutter's Fort, by the way. Isn't that a magnificent picture? And you are responsible, whether you're in Sacramento, urban forest, the suburban forest, the woodland forest, wherever you live, you are the next group of people that are going to be out there on the front lines ready to help save those trees, but don't go out on a limb doing it. <laughs> Remember, the one thing as master gardeners, this is a lot of information. I've even skipped over some stuff, and by the way, the part about um, things on how to prune and that, there's a little um, primer at the very back of your handout here on ways to prune. The part on fertilizing, I've put some stuff in your little tree care brochure. It tells you all you need to know. You know what? Use the cheapest thing available and don't worry about fertilizing much on trees. But um, you guys are not walking encyclopedias. You are not expected to know everything. You are a resource. You know where to get information, right? So go to it. Give out that information. And thank you very much. The preceding program was part two of two parts, each 90 minutes long. There is support material available at this website, including quizzes, handouts, and lecture outlines for all presentations. Consult the UCTV programming guide for the date and time that other lectures in the series will be shown. 
It's the Definitive Guide to Gardening, produced by the University of California. The California Master Garden Handbook contains over 700 pages of in-depth information on topics such as selecting varieties, planting, growth cycles, pruning, irrigation, and harvesting. The California Master Gardener Handbook is available along with other gardening publications on the ANR Catalog website at anrcatalog.ucdavis.edu.